Namibia Votes 2024. Follow along as Cosmos 94.1 speak to various political parties and presidential candidates to find out what their position is on various political issues and social issues in the country as well as, well as environmental issues. My name is Jeanette Bierkes and I will be taking you through this interesting series as we will be uncovering what our parties stand for and the presidential candidates stand for and who you should vote for 27 November. I am doing very well. That's How are lovely. you doing? I'm also great. It's lovely to have you in the studio. <laughs> Thank you so much. Our humble studio that you have here. <laughs> Thank you so much for the invitation. It's a big pleasure. Mm -hmm. So I'll just jump and start with our first question. Mm -hmm. So what I just wanted to find out from you is with yeah. the increasing poverty levels in the country, yeah. what would you say would your solution be as a presidential mm. candidate? Mm -hmm. And um, in terms of finding sustainable solutions mm -hmm. and maybe addressing the root causes as well. Yeah. Look, I think we 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 don't have uh, necessarily an increasing level in poverty. I think we have failed mm -hmm. from the onset from independence to address the root causes of what caused poverty in this country which was uh, we had structurally an economy that was skewed to only provide for a few. And then everybody else was left out of that economy. And when everything freed up, we did not address the, the fact that we now have an economy that must cater for everybody. Um, so when we got into 2015, 2016, where we had a lot of um, large economic projects coming to an end. We had the WUSAP mine that was being constructed. We had quite a bit of trade happening with Angola. Angola experienced its oil price crash. Um, and we had a lot of spending that was happening in this economy that was coming from the Angolan customer. So those exports stopped. The big major construction projects stopped. WUSAP stopped. We had the construction of um, Grove Mall that also stopped, and there were some other malls that were also being constructed around the country. And we have not reacted in any way. And then add on that COVID, where a lot of people were then retrenched. And we've not reacted in any way. Mm -hmm. um, I assume we haven't reacted because perhaps we didn't have the fiscal space to be able to react, but we need to address it. I'm now coming from my first part of what I'm calling my introduction to around the country. And I have gone and I've covered 75% um, of Namibia's population because I've done all the, the, the regions in the north, starting all the way from um, uh, um, Oshi Oshikoto, uh, yeah, Oshikoto, going up to um, Oshana, Omsati, Ohangwena, Kavango West, Kavango East, Zambezi. The only one that I still have left out in terms of, kun of the north is the Kunene region, okay. which I'm going to now do. And I have seen levels of poverty in this country that no economist that is seated in this Vintuk offices or around the capital would have any appreciation of. Yeah. And it is so dire that um, I'll use an example, which is that I... For the first time in my entire trip, saw a clean child two days before I left Katima. Sure. And Katima was my last, my last leg of my trip. I've done 7,260 kilometers. Um, I've been on the road for eight, eight weeks, nearly nine weeks. And to see a clean child two days before I return is quite shocking. Yeah. So what does that say? People do not have the basics. You don't have soap to just buy so that you can wash the clothes where those children are being uh, clothed in. I'm assuming maybe there is some point where the children do get washed, um, but people are lacking the most basic, basic, basic of things. You go most of the regions and you're seeing our mothers that are carrying this um, heavy, I don't, I don't even know what to call them, tanks or there's like water things, water carriers on their heads mm -hmm. and walking distances. 
it made it easier for some of us to kind of get around and have conversation because then we were having conversations around the watering hole because that's people where that that's where people were meeting because they don't have water infrastructure in their homes. Um, so our levels of poverty in the country are at a crisis level. We've declared now a national disaster because of the drought, but we need to declare a national disaster because of the high level of poverty that this country is experiencing. I mean, we I read now in the reports that 47 people have died because of hunger. Yeah. Yeah. And then there was 100 plus that have died in the market region because of malnutrition. Yeah. It's at a crisis level. One life lost in this country because of lack of food which is an indication of how high our levels of poverty are. We are not a country that is, in a, has got, is experiencing a famine. We are not a country that is at war. Um, so for one person to die because they don't have food, which is a basic human need, and our constitution starts out to say that you've got this right, this very basic right to life. Yeah. But everything that we are doing does not talk to that. So we are at a crisis level in terms of the levels of poverty in Namibia. Um, and for me, in terms of the solutions, so what I'm proposing is every election, um, the current governing and, and ruling party has always spoken about pension, right? Every election. But what we did see is um, in the 2014 elections, the late president campaigned to say he wanted to increase pension from 400 to 1,000 Namibian dollars. Do you know what that did to our poverty rate? It decreased it by 18%. Okay. So in, in some way, if you give direct money to people, then you can cut the levels of poverty because we're living in a highly cashified society. Every service, every goods that you are going to either need, you need to pay money. You either need to go into a shop and buy those, um, or you need to pay for services, water, electricity, and those items, those requires money. So my proposal is that for every Namibian that's between the age of 18 and 59, and we do it for a period of three years, that there must be some form of basic income that they receive. Mm -hmm. Now I'm calling it a hand up, it's not a hand out, because Nam a lot of Namibians need a hand up from the situation of where they are finding themselves. And it's 1,750, and we do that per month where they get that, that income to keep them from uh, poverty, and we do it for a period of three years. So that's my proposal. And, and it's, it sounds very, very basic. Yeah. Yeah, uh, but the, the Basic Income Grant Coalition, which is under the Economic Justice Trust, has done this research in terms of what happens when you put money into an economy. Mm -hmm. What happens when you put money into a community? Because eventually that ends up back generating economic activity. People are buying goods and services and not just addressing their own needs, but you also can get that economic activity back that we've been missing since 2015, 2016. And they've done it in a community which is um, east of Vintuk in Omitara. Now I went there. I went there on the 1st of May. Uh, which was then when I started my uh, my tour around the country. And when I got there, um, it doesn't seem like there's significant change in that community. But then somebody pointed out to me to say, but before this community got to the level where they are now living in like the corrugated shacks, mm -hmm. and some of them in brick houses, they were living in plastic bags, black oh. plastic bags that was their form of shelter. And what they have now done with that, it was 100 Namibian dollars. It wasn't even a lot of money. But that 100 Namibian dollars was given to everybody that was in that community. Whether you're a child, whether you received pension, whether you worked, whether you didn't work. And what then happened is businesses started to start up that couldn't previously exist. Mm -hmm. Because now the community has got money. There's a lady there that has started a bakery. She sells her little bread still to this day for one Namibian dollar. Sure. And now people could buy. There's another guy who started a business there, which was making bricks, because now people could buy so that they could build uh, homes for themselves. Uh, there's a, another lady who was uh, having a, a clothing business. She was sewing clothes, and people could buy clothes from there. So you now had economic activity in a community that previously had nothing. 
So it works. It's been proven to work even all over the world where you say you trust people with money because at the moment we've come to this place where yes, government uh, does have some interventions. One of them is for instance, drought relief, where they are giving a bag of maize meal, they're giving four tins of fish and they're giving cooking oil. Mm -hmm. Who says I'm not allergic to maize meal? <laughs> Who says I'm not allergic to fish? Why could you not take the same amount of money that you've allocated to drought relief, cut out all the administration, cut out all the logistics costs, and split that money with all your recipients and let them go into the shops and buy what they need. Mm -hmm. But what you're communicating to that person is actually don't trust you with money. I must be the one that goes and buys what I think you must eat and deliver it to you, right? And it's the same conversation with pension. We trust people that are above the age of 60 to look after their families, handle money well, mm -hmm. but we don't trust you below the age of 60. And for me, it's just utter madness. Yeah. But because we've seen that the increase in pension has decreased poverty, if we did it for everybody that is now in need, and we've got the highest unemployment rate in the world, so that te tells you that the bulk of your population is in need. And once you hit the kind of the, the, the economic levels that Namibia is experiencing, right, where you've got high unemployment, you, we are literally a supermarket economy, the type of jobs that you will find are retail jobs and they're security jobs. Because mm. everybody now needs their site to be protected because there are a lot more people that are looking for opportunities to get something that they cannot get through a job, yeah. right? And these retail jobs, the security jobs, don't pay very high. So even the people that are employed need some form of income protection. Our capital has become a capital where it is predominantly made up of shacks. And it is because a lot of the people that are employed, in fact, the majority of people that are employed, 425,000, if my number is not mistaken, um, out of the 729,000 that are employed Namibians are in the informal sector, right? So if you take informal, if you take retail jobs, if you take security jobs, those are people that are actually earning even below what would be a living wage. So they also need to be included in part of um, this basic income assistance, which I'm calling the Rise Together program, immediate relief for our families. And we can gradually together rise above the level of poverty in Namibia. Yeah. So that's my, that's my proposal. Okay, awesome. Yeah. So heading over to the second question, we also just wanted to find out, it seems like you have identified these problems already, mm -hmm. but is there a pressing issue, um, perhaps if you have a manifesto or mm -hmm. a pressing issue that you found in the country mm -hmm. that should be addressed, what is it? Yeah. And how are you going to solve and address that problem? Yeah. yeah. Look, <laughs> When you get to a crisis level, everything is a problem, <laughs> right? But um, you need to kind of distill them into what are the main problems and which are the ones that will give you a greater return in terms of resources and a greater return based on effort, mm -hmm. right? And I've distilled them to, to, to essentially three. And I did launch my manifesto on the 29th of, um, of April. Before um, the ruling party. Yes. <laughs> no, the 30th of April, yeah. the, 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 the last day in, in April, which was to coincide with the first year after making the announcement that I'm going to be contesting. Mm -hmm. It's before the ruling party. It's, in fact, before any other uh, party has launched. I did see a document prior to my launch, which was somewhere in March, uh, from one of the political formations. But after I launched, they said, no, they didn't actually, because nobody reacted to that document. They've now come out and said, no, they are going to be launching in August. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm going to take it that I'm the first one that has launched a manifesto. Yeah. But for me, it was important because of my background. So I'm a detailed, detailed person. I'm a chartered accountant by profession. And because I'm not a politician, I'm using a political platform to try and advocate for change and provide economic leadership using a political platform. So I needed to do things that I know um, and which was, if you're wanting to communicate something to someone, you need to have something in writing. Mm -hmm. You need to have your thoughts quite clear. So uh, Manifesto launched on the 30th of April. And the three main items um, are that we need to address 
the high level of poverty in, in, in the country. It's, it's, a, it's a real big problem and income inequality, right? Mm -hmm. So that's now the immediate relief program that I've spoken about, 1,750 for every Namibian between the age of 18 and 59 for a period of three years. The second one is we need to get money to our businesses. Um, so, and this was confirmed for me as I traveled right through the, the regions that I've traveled. What I found is Namibian business people are trading outside of what you would call kind of the formal trading centers, which is malls mm -hmm. and shopping centers. They're the ones that are trading on the curb. Yeah. They're the ones that are trading in this beach tents. You know, if anybody had a beach tent business, so they would be making money. Um, and then the foreign retailers, predominantly South African retailers, are the ones that are trading in our shopping centers. Now, what is so said for me is these shopping centers, many of them have been constructed with GIPF money, mm. right? GIPF money is money that comes from government employees because it's a government institution's pension fund. So it's government employees, it's our teachers, it's our nurses, it's our defense force, it's our police, it's our administrators, right? Local domestic savings that are building infrastructure for the benefit of foreign retailers. And then our businesses are trading outside of those centers, all of them, every shopping center you go to, even here where we, where, where we, where we are um, on the other side, Marwa. Mm. There by the taxi ring, that's where our traders are. You would count on your finger, probably one or two, th uh, three traders that are Namibian that are in the shopping center. Uh, and this story repeats itself right through the entire country. So the second um, issue that we need to address is that we need to get our business people up and running. And how do we do that? By giving them the one thing that we've kept away from them. Again, money. So my proposal is to set up an enterprise Namibia fund, which will be seeded with 12 billion Namibian dollars. And the 12 billion Namibian dollars is not kind of a number that I got out of the air. I've based it on the fact that we are paying interest on debt that we have accumulated, on money that we have spent that has not given us a return because it has not produced anything. The only thing that I can see that we have used with that money is perhaps I can see is the roads, but nothing else is it that I can see. And we're paying 12 billion, close to 13 billion in interest on dead money. So my proposal is let's put 12 billion invested into the future because the only people that create jobs are businesses. Government is not a creator of jobs. Our government at the mo moment is creating 91,000, there is 91,225 Namibians that are employed by the government of Namibia. It's a very small number. Yeah. Yeah. Because our working age, every Namibian that's between the age of 18 and 59, there's 1.8 million of us. 91,225 are working in the government of Namibia, and I'm excluding the number for the Ministry of Defense, because that's never shared for security reasons, obviously. But then you can just assume and add that on. It will not come close to 120 or 110,000 that are employed in government. So the next area of people that can create jobs for us is through our businesses, but our businesses do not have access to capital. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm proposing the 12 billion fund under Enterprise Namibia, and let's get the entrepreneurial spirit in this country going again. Um, the third one that we need to address, which is really at a crisis level, like I said, we've got the highest unemployment rate in the world, is to address unemployment. And for me, I, 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 I normally like to set big audacious goals, because if you set big audacious goals, even if you meet it halfway, right? You've still done something versus setting a goal that is attainable. Yeah. You attain it and you've achieved nothing. So I've set an ambitious goal for us. And I've said within the next three years, we can create 500,000 jobs. And the way that we do that is we just look at the way that we are currently doing things. We look at who is our biggest, who's, who's the one, what's the one entity that has got the biggest purse, right? It's government. Government procures services, goods and services through the operational budget. It procures goods and services through the development budget in terms of infrastructure. But we have most of that money flowing out of Namibia. Now, the first thing you do is you say, the government of Namibia, which is heavily reliant on taxpayers' money, 
individuals like you and me, because our budget is 82 billion in terms of tax, in terms of revenue for the for the year. The majority of that is coming from Namibians that are working and Namibians that are consuming goods and services through VAT. That's the majority of it. Because our mining companies, both diamond and um, non-diamond mining companies, are only contributing 2.95 billion. So that's close to 3 billion out of the 82 billion. The other normal companies are contributing 8.4 billion. So the remainder is coming from you and, you, you and me, right? Um, but then we take that very same amount of money and we export it out by the bulk of our contracts where government is procuring goods and services, procuring infrastructure, tendering it out and it's going to Chinese companies predominantly. So we're exporting money out. And then the bulk of the things that we are buying, goods and services, we're all buying almost 100% from South African retailers. Mm -hmm. So we're exporting money out. So the first thing to do is to say, if you've got the biggest purse as government, you've got the biggest muscle. So use that, use your, your, your purse to create the jobs. Firstly, let's stop with the tendering thing that we are on, where we are tendering out work to foreign companies. So government needs to come to a position where this is what I'm proposing, this is what I will do, where there is not one cent that leaves the bank account of Namibia for the government of Namibia going to a foreign company. And by foreign company, I include those companies that are registered in Namibia that are foreign owned, right? If there is somebody that wants to access taxpayers' money through the government of Namibia, then you need to have your company that is majority Namibian owned. Mm -hmm. So at least we can retain that money in Namibia. But also, if we procure for um, especially infrastructure, let us look at points where we can use a lot more people on these construction sites, on this infrastructure deployment, on this infrastructure acquisition. Let's use as much manpower as possible. I'll use the example of this road that's cutting across and going to the airport. Mm -hmm. We've been building that road now for 10 years. We started 2014. We're in 2024. Do we need to be building a road for 10 years? No. Probably not. No. <laughs> and if we've got such a high unemployment rate, if we had said our focus is on the creation of jobs, every dollar we spend should create a job, right? Or every 100,000 that we spend should create a job. I know I've got data from um, one of the Namibian big food manufacturers. They, they know that it takes them a million to create one job, one sustainable job. We can set the same target for ourselves and say, Every million we spend as government money should create one job, one sustainable job. So if we deployed a lot of people that are out and sitting on our streets on that road, we would have constructed that road in three years and finished. And at the same time, we would have created jobs. We've got a need for infrastructure in this country, predominantly water, classrooms. But every year we scatter the budget. So we put a little bit of water, a little bit to water, a little bit to classrooms, a little bit to agriculture, a little bit to building roads, a little bit to railway, a little bit everywhere and achieving nothing. So we need to concentrate our efforts and say, what is our most pressing infrastructural needs and how many jobs can we get out of every, every $1 million that we are spending? And the aim should be one job, one sustainable job that we can keep. So my proposal is that we are going to make sure that we will focus on three key areas. One is water. Now, everywhere I've gone, Oshikoto is the one region that doesn't have water, right? Every time I go there, there is water that is like not running in the, in the, in the taps. You can open, no water. Our children are dying in this, um, I don't have the English word for it, I can't call it a borehole because it's not a borehole. Like a water pit or something. Yeah, a water pit. And they are falling in there and, and, they, are, and they are dying. Yeah. And nobody is saying, okay, but what if we just focus on water harvesting infrastructure, water storage infrastructure, and water piping infrastructure? And we don't do a little bit here and there. We focus on it, say for three years, until we are done. Be done with water infrastructure. You cannot be constructing water infrastructure for 34 years. Yeah, we're still and then, constructing but, pit latrines, by the way. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But for 34 years, you're just giving a little bit of something. 
Um, so if we focused on, on, on water infrastructure, you know what we will do? Mm -hmm. We'll provide not just job opportunities, but for the first time, we can have our farmers, which is half of our population, by the way, both commercial and rural, the people that are in the rural areas are all focused on, 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 on farming. They're all in their fields, all of them. You can then address the economic challenges that is posed to our rural uh, households and our rural farmers. Because at the moment, they are reliant on, on, on rainwater, which is, as we know, unreliable because of climate change, right? Um, so if you sorted out water, then you can have our farmers farming for the stomach and for their pocket because you've sorted out water. They can be in their fields three times a year. Yeah. And we can sort out food. We will not need drought relief if we diverted that money towards provi provision of water infrastructure. We will not have our children having to walk to the rivers to go and bathe in these rivers. I mean, I came to a community where there was an offshoot of the Kavango River and um, families come there to wash their clothes. Families, kids come there to bathe. Old people come there to bathe in a river, mm -hmm. still 34 years after independence. Uh, we've come to certain communities and um, the entire community, you're asking, where are the people? No, they're by the river, right? Why don't you just pipe that water to where the people are? So that's, that, that's the one. So if we just focus on, on, on water infrastructure, we can create thousands and thousands of jobs because digging for water harvesting and then the storage, and then the piping, that takes manpower. The second infrastructural need that we need to focus on and finish and be done with is classrooms. So we have a need of 2,186,000 ,000 classrooms in Kavango West, Kavango East, Omsati region, and Oshana. That's 2,186 teachers that have graduated, have qualified, that are sitting at home, not because there are no jobs for them, because there are no classrooms for them to teach from. So we then are using people to do the construction. And then immediately once the construction is finished, you can get the teachers into, into jobs. And if you run platoon systems for some of these classrooms or the schools, then you will have kids that are going to school in the morning. And then you can have the younger ones going to school in the afternoon. They don't have to get up so early because of the long distances that they have to walk. So that's 2,186 times two teacher jobs that you can create. Then we've got all of our government garages right around the country littered with these dead vehicles. Mm -hmm. It could just be that there's a small part that's missing, but we never replace these parts. We never fix a vehicle that breaks. But we've got mechanics that are graduating from VTCs. So what if we said all these government vehicles that are all littered right around the country. We gave opportunities, direct opportunities, not through a tender, but through an ordering system for every VTC graduate. There you've got another group of people that you can provide jobs to. Then the big chunk of it is we've got schools, hostels, hospitals, clinics, police stations that we've built. And the one challenge that we have as government is we have not maintained. It's like maintenance is not a subject that we like. Mm -hmm. So for 34 years, we've not maintained. So my proposal is that we put, uh, we allocate 5 billion from the capital budget, which is already in the capital budget, but which is allocated to building of regional offices. We love building these big regional offices that we're giving contracts to Chinese companies that are not going to house a lot of people. We are spending money in this current year's budget on army bases. We're not a country at war, but we've got unemployed people that are out there. All these army bases are being constructed through August 26, a government entity. Like just things that don't make sense, yeah. right? But if we redirected that money and put together then the total 5 billion, where we then say we are going to be focusing on for the next five years, the renovation of all of the infrastructure that we have built. Do you know how many people we can pick up off the street? It's painting work, it's repairing, repairing ceiling boards, it's putting the windows back. It is making sure that our abolition facilities are actually working. There are some hostels that we have built where there are no abolition facilities. But this is not work that requires for you to go out on a tender and give it to a big construction company. 
you use your VTC graduates. We go back to a system, and people don't like this when, when, when a person says that there was a system that worked with the old government, mm, they right? Do. With the apartheid, apartheid, apartheid regime, government. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, there was a system that worked. And the way the system worked was when you graduated from a vocational training center, you registered with the Ministry of Works and Transport. And when there was something that broke at any of the government infrastructure, they will call you and they will say, Ali, you've registered, you are a plumber. There's plumbing work at the school because you are registered in this region. So I went to Centaurus High School. And when I got there, the school did not look the way that it looks now, right? But it's just maintenance. Yes. Because everything must be tendered out. But now imagine you are re repairing a door. Yeah? That door might cost you $2,000 Namibian dollars. But you're going to tender it out to place an ad in the newspaper is $12,000 Namibian dollars. To replace a door for $2,000 Namibian dollars? Mm -hmm. And you haven't even started the tendering process? So there are just certain things that we do that do not make sense. So for me, it's in this five billion and let's just get into renovation. Let's give people the basic opportunity for them to be able to get into the job market. Yeah. So really for me, those are the three things that I think will give us the biggest uh, payoff and address our biggest issues. So it's less lack of incomes that our people don't have access to income because they're not working. So it's the immediate relief for our families, the 1,750 our businesses need to be able to be able to compete and to get into business and to sustain those businesses. So it's a 12 billion fund through Enterprise Namibia so that we can create the jobs through business. And then it's the immediate jobs program, which is targeting with an ambitious target of creating 500,000 jobs. Yeah. And I feel if we kind of do it in that, in that way, and all three of them need to happen at the same time, you can't sort of pick and choose because even if you say you're going to just focus on job creation and not think about creating um, or, or giving this immediate uh, relief of money, we still will be dealing with the consequences and the outcomes of poverty. And I'm sure we'll get to that in, your, in, your, in one of your questions. Because the consequences and, and, and outcomes of poverty are very severe on our system, even on the pool on the budget, right? So a person that um, has had to experience poverty all their life through. The way they think is different. Mm. Yeah, their outlook on life is different. You've got, we've got mental issues. Then we've got an alcohol problem. A person who is not in a job, not doing anything, what else do they do? What's the one thing that is accessible in all of these communities that are uh, exposed to high levels of poverty? Every second house, is a shabin. Mm. So that's the one thing that you see. You see as a child growing up, the way people are coping is through consumption of alcohol. So when you get to a point where you now need to be working and you don't have access to a job, where do you go? To the shabin. Yeah. And, and to kind of create those 500,000 jobs, although it's an ambitious target and I'm wanting for us to get it done in a period of three years, I know it will be a gradual process because you still have to get the ordering uh, uh, system up and running. You still need to get all of these people registered. You still need to procure the materials for the renovation work to start. So we can't kind of just pick the one over the, the other. So we need to do the three of them at the same time. And I feel if we do that, then we'll address the bigger part of the issues that we are that we are facing and, and, and the problems that we are facing in Namibia. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And then when we look at the uh, main structural problems in our economy in Namibia, mm -hmm. let's get to that one, the exam <laughs> question. <laughs> what would the steps be um, that you would take to address them? Yeah. So first, what are they? Yeah. And what are the steps yeah. to address it? Sure. That's, um, it's a big question, but it's such an important question. So structurally, we haven't deconstructed what came about in this country through all of the apartheid laws, mm -hmm. right? And I say that because why our business people at the moment don't have access to capital is because we've got redlining in the application of finance, right? We what does redlining mean, sorry? Oh, redlining. Redlining is where um, you use a barrier. Uh, you use a barrier that, dif that kind of oh, okay. differentiates yeah, the people. Poor from the rich. Yeah, the like poor the from the rich. Yeah. So if I'm applying for a business loan and I am 
uh, in a sector that is previously unfunded, say the taxi industry, okay? It's our biggest transporting uh, segment. If our taxi industry in Namibia doesn't work, our people don't get to work, mm -hmm. yeah? Yeah. If you've got somebody who's assisting you at home and is a domestic worker or your gardener and they don't have, many of them don't have vehicles and our taxi industry doesn't function, they'll not get to work. But there's no bank that finances taxis. And it's because it's a segment that is predominantly black. It's a segment where we've said, this is a segment where the car is always getting kind of uh, bashed or whatever it is. So we've put a nuance around that industry and you've redlined that industry out. Yeah, even for insurance, if you were to go and apply for insurance as a taxi driver, what will your insurance be? Firstly, you won't get it because you need to say how, where, your, where your vehicle gets parked. You need to say, you know, where, where, what you use the vehicle for. So you'll not get insurance. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's redlining. So we've got redlining in finance. We've got redlining in terms of, uh, and, it's, and, it's, and it's barriers, right? So we've got redlining in terms of access to markets. Yeah. So if you've got cattle and cattle is wealth, if you've got cattle in the north of Namibia, you cannot come and trade it on this side. Yeah, we're getting to that. Yeah. Let's not let's not first jump <laughs> get to there. that. Yeah. Right. OK, so let me use another example. Um, mangoes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In the Zabezi region, every house has got multiple mango trees. Mm -hmm. OK, come December. When all of these tree, all the, all of these mangoes are ripe, they cannot transport them from there to come and sell them. On in the southern part of the country, that's redlining, right? Um, structurally, we've got the houses that were built in the northern part of Vintuk that are sitting on this urban sizes that are like two hundred square meters. You will not find, until of recent, a, a earth on the southern side of Vintuk, on the eastern side of Vintuk, on the southwest side of Vintuk, that is 200, built on 200 square meters of land, mm -hmm. right? Because if you were to access money, capital to start a business, every financial institution, and this is not unique to Namibia, it's around the world, will ask you for collateral. Yeah. Now, if you're on 200 square meters of earth, you cannot expand that house. What value can you create in that house to use it as security? So you've now kept out 100% of your entire population that is on the northern side of Ventuk from accessing productive capital. But not only have you kept them out from accessing productive capital, you've, you've kept them out from actually starting a business. So structurally, there are so many things that we have to get right because you can't sort of, okay, say I'm going to buy up every second house and expand those urbans. Those urbans are there. Those houses have been built. Families have grown up there. So structurally, there are just certain things that have been done in such a way that it's deprived a particular community and it's a big segment of our population from economic activity, right? Yeah. Um, the, the, the last one that I'll give an example of in terms of structurally what, what are the issues that we are having with our economy is we are a supermarket economy because we are built like that. We were built to be an off-taker of South African products because we were considered to be a province of South Africa. Mm. We were built to export capital into South Africa. So domestic savings, all of our domestic savings, right? Go into South Africa and then we must put in a law that says we can retain some of it. It's like you growing up, you've got a brother, and that brother is older than you. He's always kind of guided you financially. Mm -hmm. So when you get to the age where you're now working, every time you are working, every time you receive your salary, you then go to that brother and you say, here's my money. Please keep it for me because I, 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 you've always guided me financially and I still trust you with money. But now you keep doing that every month. That's Namibia between us and South Africa. So we don't have local short-term insurance companies. So all of our insurance companies, where are they exporting that money? South Africa. South Africa. The banks, we only have one local domestic bank. The rest of the money, where does that end up? 
South Africa. South Africa. <laughs> All of our, our supermarkets, who are they owned by? Mostly South African. Mostly South African, 99% South Africa. Even if you look at the local ones, your pick and pay that are in that arrangement with pick and pay and, and, and the Ottawine List Group, and you look at um, Vuman Brock, 100% nearly of their products they are procuring from South Africa, right? If you then look at the shop rights and all these other ones that are entirely South African owned, so the goods are being procured in South Africa, so you're sending money to buy the goods there. The dividends, the profits of that, of that supermarket is going back into South Africa. So the only thing you're retaining in this country are the salaries. And they are the lowest paid people because it's retail jobs. Yeah. So structurally, there are so many things that we need to change because we cannot continue being a supermarket economy. We cannot continue being an exporter of capital because we need the capital here to develop ourselves. We cannot continue to redline a certain part of our economy and a certain segment of our population from economic activity. So those are the things that we structurally we need to change. And it involves a lot of almost you have to deconstruct something. Um, and somebody gave me the example the other day to say to make a cake and bake a beautiful cake, you have to break some eggs. Mm -hmm. And we have to get there now 34 years later. And I think it's going to be a little bit painful in the beginning. And you will have those people that have got access to this capital, the ones that are making money from the Namibian money, screaming and saying, you're doing something that you shouldn't be doing. You know, you are going to be introducing risk to your economy, but we cannot continue to operate the way that we are, that we are operating. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to address the flow of domestic savings from Namibia. Because at the moment we've got, I read a report now, Namibians are uh, savers, so we've got 426 billion that is saved. A large chunk of that is sitting in South Africa, developing South Africa. And South Africa is not shy to deploy capital. <laughs> they're not shy to de deploy it. Mm -hmm. And that's why they're so far advanced ahead of us, right? So even in terms after, they got the independence after us. Yeah. They look at where they are. Yeah, yeah. So that's the first thing that we need to do structurally is saying domestic savings anything that we domestically save here i don't have an issue with foreign capital coming in and leaving again but anything that is domestic savings must be retained here to develop namibia so that's one of the things and i know there's going to be an uproar and there's going to be people screaming and saying no you can't be doing that but we have to do it mm. it's just one of those things that we have to do and and we have to kind of learn that we can stand on our own and we might not get it on the first try no. But certainly the second time when you've learned something, I mean, there are so many mistakes I've made in life, but if I, if I get to kind of the same juncture, I know, okay, I, ca I cannot go down that road. I must go down this road because this road got me into trouble the last time when I, when I went down that road. But it gives you a chance to learn and to gain experience and to do things differently and progress and build up. So that's the first thing that we need to do. The second thing that we need to do structurally is break Break every red tape that we have, every red lining that we have. And I know you're going to get to that question, um, but we have to dismantle all of them. Mm. But the first thing that we need to do is we need to identify all of them because there's one that we all love and there's one that we clearly identify, but there are so many others and we have to dismantle all of those. And we need to get to the point where as Namibians, we are comfortable to have the difficult conversations. Yes. Yeah. In South Africa, uh, many people have very difficult conversations and they're not scared to have those difficult conversations. And sometimes they're very uncomfortable conversations, but that's the only way that you can crack and get through an issue. Now in Namibia, we don't like to have conversations. We don't like, we don't like to have difficult conversations. We don't watch the conversations yeah. out there. Yeah. <laughs> so, 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 so that's going to be the, the one kind of in terms of highlighting what are these red lines that we have and get comfortable to have conversations with each other because that's the only way that we're gonna move forward. We're all Namibians, the bulk of us that are here, right? And to move forward and to move forward where there is an environment that caters for everybody, we need to be comfortable to say, this is right, this is wrong, this, let's do this. And it's gonna be to the benefit of all of us, right? And then um, thirdly, we need to change our tax code when it comes to what we call now foreign investment that we love so much of our own investors. Now for me, I love the local investor because they've got nowhere else to go. Mm -hmm. They have to make it work here. 
but a foreign investor can come to you and tell you, no, I want this, I want this, I want this, I want this. You miss one out of the 10 uh, requ re requests that they've given you, they ship out and they go, right? So we need to kind of become a little bit more bolder with these people that are saying they want to come and invest in Namibia and say, this is, the w this is how much we want to retain. Um, and there's a conversation around ownership that I'm not kind of too much in support of, um, especially when it comes to like mines and oil and gas and all those other things, because I think you can do it through your text code if your text code is right. Like a lot of the other countries, Finland has gotten it very, very well. Qatar has gotten it very, very well, where they are very clear what is the what is the take of the nation, and a nation takes not through ownership. A nation takes in terms of taxes, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So we then need to be very clear around these foreign investors to say, if our tax code says for non uh, diamond mining companies, we need to have 37.5% of your profits. Why is it that we're only getting 1%? So clearly there's something there that they are bamboozling us and we're not, we're not reacting to it, right? So we need to now be very firm and the biggest contributors to our revenue should be all of these, what we are calling our big economic segments diamond or not not diamonds the mining industry which is making up 12 percent about 12 percent of our gdp 62 percent of our exports but only contributing 3.49 percent of our taxes namibians cannot be breaking their back to develop their own country when they are so well endowed with not just mining resources but well endowed with um with uh, renewable energy resources well endowed with fishing fishing resources i mean fisheries doesn't even feature in terms of what are the taxes that we are getting from the fishing sector. Yet we've got, we are in the top 10 of the longest coastlines in the world. Yeah. So for me, those are the three things from a structural point of view that we need to be kind of focusing on. Okay, awesome. Yeah. So um, we've done a lot of social issues, economical stuff. Yeah. Let's get to more technological that I think will um, indirectly also address what we've discussed earlier. Mm -hmm. So how will you empower rural communities, especially yeah. with the fourth industrial revolution, yeah. keeping in mind that we have such a big digital divide in our country? Yes. So we need to start at the basics. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's really this journey, um, which is now lasted a year and a bit, has revealed to me that we, we kind of wanted to operate here so when we're talking fourth industrial revolution, we hear you've got a smartphone, I've got a smartphone. Uh, a lot of our friends have got smartphones. Mm -hmm. Do you know that when I leave the capital and I'm out in the village, I've got no network. Yeah. So I had plans to do, for instance, live streams, you know, three days in a week do a Facebook live stream. I was wondering what's do going on with Ali. I didn't do see anything in <laughs> Do an X, an X session, a Twitter space. Cannot do it. No network. So we cannot even have a conversation about the fourth industrial revolution when 99% of your rural population does not even have a smartphone. Mm. They cannot afford a smartphone because they've got no access to incomes, right? So th we, need to, we need to sort out the basics first, give people access to an income so they can afford all these things that enables them to participate in an economy where there's technology that needs to be used. Secondly, sort out connectivity around this country. We've got no connectivity around this country that enables a person to be able to even use their smartphone when you're out in the village. Um, if I go to um, Oshkoto, Oshana, it is ridiculous. If I get to um, Kurenkuru <laughs> in the town, if I get to um, Okongo, everybody knows, oh, you're going to Okongo. Okay, so we will probably, you know, You'll be in and out. If I'm sending you a WhatsApp, it might take you a couple. You need to literally go around that little settlement and find a place where you can get data and connectivity. 
and it's a it's a settlement that has got all the shops. It's got a pick and pay. It's got it's got a lot of the shops. All the banks are there, but connectivity is an issue. Yeah. So we need to start at the basics first before we can start to talk about empowering the rural community. Yes. Yeah, okay. and that's the way that we can empower people because a lot of them. Um, if I just think of Zambezi, Kavango East, Kavango West, those are like tourist hotspots. Mm -hmm. So if a tourist comes there and maybe they want to get some of our curios, you know, they do wonderful furniture up there in the Zambezi and in the Kavango, right? Wooden furniture. Um, if they want to sell that wooden furniture, or they want to sell their curios, or whatever it is that they want to sell to a tourist who might have been there to get an online business up and going, you can't because you haven't started out the basics, which is connectivity. Yeah. Yeah. True. Yeah. Okay. So when we also, we've spoken about youth unemployment yeah. briefly, and we know that that will remain an issue. I mean, it's almost at 50% mm -hmm. when mm -hmm. NSA probably released the full report, then we'll see how high it actually is. Yeah. And I'm yeah. wondering why they are delaying release, releasing that report. Yeah, they, they said it will probably come So mm. Let's be patient. <laughs> So when it comes to youth unemployment, yeah. what would you say you're currently doing to address the issue? Yeah. So for me, um, as a numbers person, numbers always tell an answer. And I think one of the reasons why we haven't been able to really tackle youth unemployment is because we have not understood what's the driver for why we've got such a high youth unemployment rate. Now, firstly, <clears throat> we got our education system wrong. Mm. we adopted, accepted an education system that allows us to send a 16-year-old child, a 15-year-old child out onto the street when they fail grade 10. That's where we, we start. And for a long time, we were there. So we've put out 336,000 young Namibians that are unskilled. So what do you do with that? Mm. What are you doing with it? <laughs> <laughs> um, because it is such a massive problem, it cannot be tackled by one person, right? So even in my own private capacity, it's not something that I'll be able to tackle. But it was one of the things that drove me into business. Yeah. So I was a partner at KPMG. And then at that time, um, before even the, the Namibian Statistics Agency was kind of became an agency out of um, NPC, there was a statistic that was released that said our unemployment was 50%. Before and it's, for everything, how long yeah, was that? This must have been somewhere in 2010, 2009. Yeah. Sure. And it scared me. Mm. It scared me because at that time I was married to um, my ex-husband and uh, he is from Zim. So for 16 years maybe 18, because we, we started dating before we got married, but we were married for 16 years. I would visit Zim at least once a year. And I saw how that economy went from where it was a flourishing economy to where it went through what it went through and became, you know, this uh, economic meltdown that they had. Yeah. And, and, and what was the difference for me was the fact that they had a manufacturing base that Namibia didn't have. So as I was going through this and, and kind of, checking out the statistics, I said, I said to myself, no, we need to do something. And then I had just experienced something in Zim that I thought, if this were to happen in Namibia, we will be flat on our backs and not even know how to get up. Because um, I call Namibia kind of the, the, the country where we get up in the morning and we take um, our techies and we lace our left techie to our right techie and we say walk, mm. right? So when I saw that statistics, I was like, we have to do something. We can't just talk about the problem that we have. And we're very good. Middle class is very good. Over dinner, we're all complaining. So I then um, took this bold step and I started a manufacturing company. Went into manufacturing garments. And I launched Namibia's first premium clothing brand. Um, and alongside that, we wanted to now also give incomes to households. So I'm kind of doing a little bit of what I'm proposing to do is on a bigger scale, but a mini thing of what I was doing before in yeah. LEAP. Um, and then we wanted to give incomes to our households through the growing of bamboo, mm -hmm. but nobody wanted to fund that. Again, no access to capital. So we ended up 
um, operating a commercial potato and onion farming operation in Sumeb. Um, so through that, we were creating jobs. So I had created a, a group of companies that, that had uh, 89 people that were employed on a full-time basis in manufacturing, which is what I thought would be the basis for us to actually grow out of where we are. Yeah. Because what manufacturing does is it allows you to train a person fairly quickly depending on the type of machine that you have. And it allows you to take a person who is unskilled to get them operating and earning an income, right? Um, so that's what, I've, that's what I've done. So I know that it works. And we just need to give opportunities to our people that are unskilled, match them with the skilled, which is what I'm, I'm proposing in the immediate jobs program. It's predominantly focused on the skilled, which is our VTC graduates. So if you kind of think back, the 5 billion renovation program is our VTC graduates. Yeah. The building of the classrooms is our VTC graduates. The mechanics is our VTC graduates. Those guys already have certificates, but you've got this big chunk, which is 336 that have come out of our education system, don't have any skill, have not had the opportunity to go to a university, which only caters for 3% of your population, but that's the predominant avenue where we send a lot of our people. And then saying, give these guys the opportunities, right? When you give them the opportunities and you've taken away the standards that are going to foreign companies and they're going to your VTC graduates in an order form, I am proposing that we make it mandatory that every person that works on any site where that opportunity has been given to you through a government order, you must give the person that is coming from that site. Whether it's a person who was pushing the wheelbarrow, give him a certificate that says the guy can push a wheelbarrow. Mm -hmm. So when he goes to apply, he doesn't have to explain himself, no, I can push a wheelbarrow. You know, a person who is operating and running, um, running a, a, a coffee machine, who's a barista in a coffee shop, give them a certificate that says this is a qualified barista because that's what they are doing. A person who is uh, on a construction site and, a, and is a painter, give him a certificate that says, says he's a painter so that he is able to use that certificate as an opportunity for him to get the next yeah. job. And that's what we are failing to do, is we are failing to firstly create the, 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 the skills. And when we do create the skills and the talent through giving people opportunities, nobody gives people certificates. Mm -hmm. But all that person has is they've dropped out of school. Grade nine was their last certificate. They didn't get a grade 10. They got a grade 10 certificate, but not with very good marks. And every job, even if you're wanting to apply to become a cleaner in government, you need a grade 10 certificate. Yeah. So let's give people certificates. Okay. Um, and then we need to address this 336 um, group of people, 336,000 group of people. We need to get people trade skills. So we've got about 886 million um, of money that is sitting at the NTA. So NTA has now become a financial institution. 886 million is a lot of money that we should be deploying to building trade schools. So my proposal is that every region should have a trade school. So when a child gets to grade eight, and a lot of these teachers know a child that loves books and is a theory person will end up in the 3% going to the universities. And they know who's the other ones that all they love to do is work with their hands because yeah. they, are, they are struggling with the books. Mm -hmm. So by grade eight, let the child not be forced to go through all the other things. Send them to a trade school. Yeah. They're getting up every morning, they're being taught, but by the time they leave in grade 12, they've got a trade and they can immediately go into doing something for, mm -hmm. for themselves. Yeah. So that's that's my proposal. Yeah, we have to change the mindset around VTC yeah. in general. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in your view as well, let's go again back to the social issues. Yeah. What would you say are the root causes of GBV, alcohol abuse and child abuse? And how can we address this better and properly? That's more sustainable. Yeah. So gender-based violence for me is... Um, because of the high levels of poverty, a lot of the relationships have become transactional, mm -hmm. right? Um, a child comes from the rural area, the child gets sent to Vintuk, or to a Kurenkuru, or to a Rundu, I'm mentioning all the places, or a Katima, that have got VTCs, or have yeah. got institutions of higher learning. They get sent from a very far off place. That child needs 
cosmetics money. Whether you're a male or you're a female, you need lotion, you need soap, you need toothpaste, you need all of these things to look after yourself. You need food, mm -hmm. you need accommodation, you need transport money. And from the many households that I've seen, when we send our children off, those households are not able to provide for that. Yeah, even if I use the example of a child who is coming to NAST from Riobot every day, mm. the amount of transport money that they're having to pay. And then when your child is here the whole day, they need food before they go back home, right? So a lot of our children are getting into transactional relationships. And then we are seeing, if you're not maybe in, in uh, institutions of higher learning, but you're seeing all your other friends around you that have got a smartphone or they've got these wigs that we like to put on or the nails that we want to do or whatever it is, it's a guy, they've got the latest techies or whatever it is. Then you get into some form of relationship that gives you access to these things. Mm. Now, because it's trans